whole day of Friday is pretty much gauged towards the football field. Who we're playing, how good are they? Growing up in Parkersburg, you dreamt about being out there on the field on Friday nights and playing for Coach Thomas. He arrived in 1975, the new football coach in Parkersburg, Iowa, just 25 years old. Over the next 36 years, Ed Thomas would win 292 games, two state titles, and be named National High School Coach of the Year by the NFL. He sent four players to the pros, but more importantly, turned generations of Parkersburg boys into men. Men like Dave Becker, the captain of Ed Thomas's first Falcon team. We had our meeting and the rules were announced. We were gonna work harder than anyone else. We were the fourth quarter would be ours. He uh, convinced us we could be winners. He had the gift of getting kids to elevate their game to a level that they never thought they were even capable of. He expected more out of his football players, that they were gonna set the example of how to act. It was an experience that I wanted when I become a young father for each one of my kids to have. I want them to learn all the intangibles that goes with athletics that are gonna make them a better husband, a better dad, a better member in their community, and their church, just a better citizen. Never were those lessons more important than May 25th, 2008. Talking massive disruption, large gas leaks, um, flattened houses. I'm very serious. They need to get here and shut down this area. In just a matter of seconds, the tornado destroyed hundreds of homes and killed eight people. A big part of my life is this school. As you look at our athletic facilities, all destroyed, we're going to rebuild. Because I don't know how else you deal with it, but to move forward. With his own house amid the rubble, Ed Thomas guided Parkersburg out of the wreckage. Flanked by his current and former players, Thomas led a cleanup effort with an ambitious goal, restore the football field in time for the Falcons' home opener, just 100 days away. He just set the tone very early. We were going to dust ourselves off. We are going to help each other, and we are going to get through this. I asked him, Coach, what can I do? He said, well, we have to get all the bleachers off the football field. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Dave, I'm, I'll leave you in charge of that. Alongside the football field being rebuilt, we were rebuilding our town. So it was an end goal to look forward to kind of that fall that we could do something normal, because nothing was normal that year. And so on September 5th, with seemingly every one of Parkersburg's 1,900 citizens in the stands and a national audience watching on TV, Ed Thomas gathered his team in a makeshift locker room known as the Bus Barn. Every player that's ever played on that field, I guarantee you, is thinking about you tonight. Fellas, I've been in this for 36 years. I've had some tremendous experiences. Nothing is going to be greater than going out there tonight. Just the fact they could play through that devastation and the team, the way they came together. Yeah! Yeah! Good luck, Becker! It was definitely emotional, especially after the summer we went through. There's no question in my mind we will be a better school and a better community than we ever were before. Thank you. Big night. Well done. Coach Thomas led the Falcons to an 11-1 record that season. And as winter turned to spring and then summer, the town began to look like itself again. Last June, a little more than a year after the tornado, the football team resumed early morning workouts back in the bus barn. When you're done lifting, you just tell him you're done lifting, and he would say, see you later. Just see you, Coach, just like every other day. We uh, had, a, I think, a shooting right now in the bus barn down at the high school. In the bus barn? Yeah. Kids just come running out and said somebody shot Ed Thomas. Ed Okay. Just a few moments after Scott Becker drove away, unbeknownst to him, his older brother Mark, a former Falcon starting lineman who had been recently diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, walked into the bus barn and in front of 22 students pulled out a gun and shot his former coach seven times. The chief of police told me that it was Ed and that he'd been shot in the head several times and he didn't want me to go in there. So I called Aaron then to let him know what was going on. My mom is probably one of the calmest people I've ever met, but I could hear something in her breath. I knew it wasn't good. 
It was already on CNN. And that's when we had found out that he had passed away. And I instantly just started thinking about my boys. To tell a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and six-year-old, how, how are you going to explain this? It's kind of like you just get punched in the stomach. I just told her, sorry, I couldn't be here. The Thomas's world was shattered. Across town, another family would soon be stunned to learn that the killer was their own son. My phone's ringing. I pick it up, and it's my neighbor saying, you better get home. There's a lot of squad cars flying up your driveway. A couple of the sheriff deputies filled me in on it was Mark. I can remember, obviously, kind of uh, falling apart there. I called my husband. I said, Dave, did you hear about Coach? And he said, Joan, you've got to get somebody to give you a ride home. I couldn't wrap my mind around how a kid who dad had taught and coached and, and reached out to would ever do something like this to him. My son was responsible for taking such a good man. How do you get over that? She wondered how this was all going to play out. How are we going to live tomorrow? I was concerned about being able to live in this community. The Thomas family immediately addressed those concerns when just hours after the murder, they held a press conference and made an appeal to the town. Not that you prepare you for what our family, uh, our community is going through. We also want to make sure we express our concern and our compassion for the Becker family. We ask that people pray for them as well. How do you stand up there and offer comfort and prayers to the family of the person who shot your dad? And it took a lot of courage for Aaron to do that. Dad always taught us to lead by example. If we're going to tell somebody to reach out and support the Beckers, and if we're not doing it, um, you know, that's not very good character. The day after the murder, Aaron and Todd sought out Scott Becker, one of Coach Thomas's players who was struggling to come to grips with what his older brother had done. Our biggest concern, my brother and I, was just that for Scott to know this wasn't his fault. Right away, they said, we're here with you. That was probably the first time I broke down. Thousands came from across the country to Parkersburg for the funeral. But as the Thomas family mourned, they somehow found the strength to continue consoling the Beckers. This is a note that Jan gave to an usher, and it says, give to Joan Becker. Joan, Dave, and boys, we love you and are here too. Hang in there, Jan T. I'll never take this out of my Bible. Compassion is the driving force in their family. We had hundreds and hundreds of people come to our home. They would say, we just left the Thomases. Jan said to be sure and give you her love. I went down to the mailbox, and there it's every square inch of stuff full of thinking of you cards. That's when I realized that it was going to be OK in the community. Two months after the murder, the Beckers returned to Ed Thomas Field to watch their youngest son, Scott, play football again now led by a new generation of Thomases. As we approached the crowd, of course they turned and looked and just started hugging. Once that kickoff took place, you said a feeling it's going to be OK. I know Coach wasn't there, but he was there. And it was Falcon football once again. The three things that mattered to Ed Thomas the most were faith, family, and Falcon football. And he dedicated his life to sharing them with the citizens of Parkersburg. Today, a year after his death, his family is left to carry on without him. But just like Coach, they have led by example, showing uncommon strength, faith, and compassion at the darkest of times, revealing the power of forgiveness not just to a town, but the world far beyond it. And it is through the dignity and courage of his family that Ed Thomas's legacy lives on. I'll never be my dad, but if I can have some of the impact he had, I'll feel that's what I'm supposed to be doing. There's no doubt we have been faced with adversity. We made our choice on how we're going to react to it. My hope for the future is to be high school kids again, to just get to be small town Iowa, to move forward but not forget my dad and what he's taught us. Well, good morning. It's, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be here uh, to, to be the first speaker to kick today off. And I always 
start with that video a couple of different reasons. One, I, I think anytime there's visual, that's so much more than I could try to explain to you in words. And, and the second part is ESPN has a lot of money, so they can put together a nice video clip. So, um, so I kind of start with that. That kind of tells my story, so I don't have to necessarily retrace all my steps and all those things, and maybe why I'm here today. But you know, for me, growing up, I can honestly tell you as a third grader, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. felt very fortunate. As a, as a third grader, I knew I was either going to play pro football, and that one didn't go so well. And, and so my backup plan was I wanted to be a teacher, and I wanted to be a coach. And now, and I can tell you it was third grade, because that's finally when I got to go to football practice, and my mother didn't have to be with me. And I got to ride the bus to and from every game with my dad. But the biggest thing was this. As a third grader, I didn't think my dad really had a job. I just thought he really liked going to the high school every day at 6 a.m., opening the weight room. Then he liked being at the school all day with young people, and then I knew he absolutely loved going to football practice after school and being with, with those young men. And, you know, growing up, it wasn't a job. It wasn't a career. What he had was a passion. He had a passion to work with young people. And so as a young person, he said, that's what I want to do. You didn't understand impact as a third grader, and I didn't understand, you know, making a difference in other people's lives, but I got to see it firsthand. So... As a, once I was old enough to kind of hang around, I was always up at the school. I'd go hang out in the weight room after school. When the school year got over, or even during the winter, my dad was also the athletic director, so I'd just tag along with him at all the events because I got to hang out with my dad. And, and so I started to listen, knowing that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, I started to listen to the things he'd say, and I'll never forget something he constantly said to his football teams was that you never know when you're going to have a platform, and you never know when you're going to have an opportunity but you got to be ready to make the most of those moments. And to me, growing up, platforms and opportunities were always because of good things. If I worked as hard as I could possibly work, if I did what I was supposed to do, if I was a good person, if I was dependable, you know, as I got older into the high school sports, if, if I was somebody who was doing, making right decisions on the weekend, if I was in the weight room, if I was giving my best effort, that was going to give me a leadership role amongst my peers. And then beyond that, I, I got the opportunity to go play basketball at Drake University. So I got to be a, a college athlete. And it was all these platforms and opportunities that continued to open themselves. And for me, I really got to see my dad in a, in a national platform in 2005. You know, Parkersburg's 2,000 people, Applington's 1,000. And so from our 3,000 people, we had four guys playing the NFL at that time. And so the ESPN and the New York Times come to Parkersburg and they do a story on our NFL players per capita and how we had the most in the entire country. And, and they had put a piece together on my dad and all of a sudden he was nominated for the National High School Football Coach of the Year that year. Now the one thing I'll tell you about being an educator, one thing I did not understand as a third grader, nor did my father ever tell me, was that teachers don't always make very much money. And so my mom, this award comes up and my dad finds out he's going to be the recipient of the High School Coach of the Year. And part of that deal was my parents got to go to the Super Bowl that year. Now we're in January, but we know what winter's like in Iowa, negative whatever it's going to be here in the next couple days. So the excitement of my mother uh, to be able to go watch my dad get this award at the Super Bowl. Super Bowl, you usually think tropical and nice and warm. So that year, um, when my dad goes to this banquet hall to get his award, it's with all the Hall of Fame inductees that year and former Hall of Fame football players and coaches. So they're at a banquet hall. And they said, Ed, you're going to have 10 minutes to talk about whatever you want to talk about at this thing. And so my parents, for that trip, they got to go to tropical Detroit that February <laughs> for that Super Bowl. But while there, my dad gets his award, he stands up, and he decides what he's going to talk about, what he's most passionate about. You see, growing up, my dad would always tell us, you know, if you come from Parkersburg, it's a special place. It's not like this. You're going to have opportunities to do whatever it is you want to do because he instilled in us that we could accomplish whatever it is we wanted to do. And that if we were going to be from Applington Parkersburg, we were going to take pride in that. And we were going to be successful. And we were going to have opportunities that others didn't have just because of where we were from. And so in this room with these Hall of Fame football players, coaches, people who had probably never been to Iowa, of which I'm confident none had ever been to Parkersburg, my dad on that day talked about what he was most proud of. He talked about Parkersburg, Iowa. He didn't talk about how he coached four guys in the NFL or how many football games he won or anything like that. He said the same thing in that audience that he said to each and every one of us. And, you know, growing up, he always wanted us to believe we came from somewhere special. And I'm telling you, as adults, as leaders, it's our job to instill that. If we don't think we're a part of something special, I promise you your children won't either. 
your neighbors won't think it's anything special. If you're part of a church or a business, or if you're the leader of your family or your home, if you don't think that you're a part of something special, nobody who you're leading will think so either. And so for me to be able to see that and, and for my parents to have that opportunity, and because of that, my dad also got some money. He took us all to Hawaii. So an unbelievable family vacation we got to experience from winning that award because this platform is opportunity to work with young men, to coach, to make a difference in these four NFL guys who never forgot where they came from, didn't forget about Parkersburg or their high school coach after they left. Little did I know my dad had a much larger platform uh, May 25th, 2008, when our community was hit by an EF5 tornado. And on that day, what I noticed was this. Amongst when one-third of our town was completely destroyed, our high school was gone, we had seven people in Parkersburg killed that day, all of a sudden, every major news network in the entire country was to Parkersburg. And what I saw was and realized is platforms and opportunities always don't come due to positive things. My dad that day was interviewed and he had all kinds of cameras in his face. Yes, he'd been in Parkersburg for 33 years. But with all these cameras and interviews, the reason he was being interviewed was because my parents lost their home. Everything they owned was pretty much gone. My parents both lost their place of employment. Our high school was completely destroyed. My mom works for the city of Parkersburg. City Hall was also completely destroyed. So with the interviews and the microphones in his face, they were asking all these questions. Ed, you know, what are you going to do now? What do you think that this happened to you? You know, trying to set him up. And what I noticed was never once through this tough situation did my dad ever say, why me? Why did this happen to us? How come I lost my home? Why did we have to lose seven people from our community? That was never his message. And my dad was an extreme optimist almost to a fault at times. Always saw the best in other people and in other situations. And his message after losing his house was, hey, we're going to dust ourselves off, we're going to get ourselves up, and we're going to move forward. And he believed, he said, Parkersburg will be better after this tornado than it was before. And he worked tirelessly towards that goal of making Parkersburg better. And so for 13 months, I got to witness my dad work tirelessly at trying to get that football field ready to play so we could have something normal. To get that high school rebuilt in one year later so that Parkersburg wouldn't leave. But ultimately, he also had a goal. He wanted the first home built to show other people to lead by example that we're going to be able to do this. Now, at this time, I would, was teaching and as assistant principal um, at Union High School in the Port City, which was about 50 miles down the road from where I grew up. And so I'd come back, you know, often May 25th, I think, at Union. We took, I took a busload of kids over. We went and helped clean up there about four days later. We get out of school, I think, before June even ended. So I made a lot of trips to Parkersburg to help out that summer. And when I noticed this, I'll never forget one day I went back home to help uh, my dad. And they were going to get all the football equipment that could be salvaged out of the high school um, before they were going to bulldoze the school to begin rebuilding. And on that day, there was also a reporter there from the Des Moines Register. And so this reporter's following my dad around the entire time. And we have an assembly line going. We're taking pads. We're passing them out the door to the kids. They're loading them on the back of trucks and, and trailers and whatever we can find to move it to our elementary so we can get everything inventoried and ready to go for the fall. And that day, the reporter would ask my dad questions, and he would stop and talk and answer. And then he'd work a little more, and then we'd get more questions. He'd stop and talk. And I'll never forget, as we loaded the last things and the kids started to go to unload everything, the reporter from the register, leaves. I get in the truck with my dad, and we close the door, and I said, Dad, why do you keep doing all these interviews? Why don't you just give them a couple quick quotes and say, hey, I'm really sorry, um, but we got a bunch of stuff we got to get done. And I'll never forget, as only your father can do, he kind of gave me one of these in a stern look. And he said, Aaron, here's what I'm going to tell you. He said, anybody can lead when things are going well. True leadership and who you are as a person gets revealed when you're faced with adversity. He said, my life's been so easy and so good in Parkersburg since I came here in 1975. People want to know who I am, what I stand for when I'm faced with something tough, losing my home, losing our school. And that stuck with me. I didn't realize it. You know, when going through and as people came back, and when I go and speak to high schools, I always tell young people, you know, we live in the greatest state there is because only in Iowa would 2,000 people show up every day to help, to help 2,000 people who just lost their home, who lost their town. Because our neighbors need help. We still just go do what we need to do to help others. That's what makes it special. I'll tell that when I go to Florida and, and California and New York when I speak, and people look at me like I'm from another country. We couldn't pay anybody. 
They didn't get recognition. All we could say was thank you. But we still believe in when somebody's hurting or needs help, we go do it. And that's what makes us unique. And so I will tell you, as the volunteers came, my dad was so grateful and appreciative, and he didn't know what to do. But what that meant the most to my father was this, and I would see tears roll down his face. When people hadn't been in Parkersburg in 10, 20, maybe even 30 years, former teachers, staff members, community members, when they came back home. Because when we sat, sat in his government and economics class, one thing he'd constantly tell us was that never forget where you came from. And he knew when he saw former teachers, former students come back, that Parkersburg wasn't just some place they once upon a time left. It was a piece of them. It was a part of who they were. It was that somewhere special that empowered them as young people to go do great things. And so to see that, um, it was inspiring. To see the community come together and all of a sudden, if my fence was on your property line or if it was two feet too far, or my house color wasn't the right way you wanted for the neighborhood, none of those things mattered at that time. And I saw a sense of community I'd never seen before in my life. And so for 13 months to watch that excitement, I'd come back and every time I'd go home, my dad would take me up to show, show me how the high school was being rebuilt and he was so excited to get in that new building. But little did I know my platform, my opportunity, was going to come 13 months later, June 24th, 2009. I'll never forget, it was 7.56 that morning. I was between Ames and Ankeny driving down to Des Moines, actually, for uh, SAI Leadership Conference School Administrators of Iowa. Uh, my phone rings. I look at it, 7.56. I answer it to my mom. She said, Aaron, somebody came in the high school weight room. Uh, they shot your dad multiple times. It doesn't look very good. I need you to get a hold of your brother. I need you to get a hold of your dad's siblings and your grandma Thomas to let them know what's going on. i got to go. My mom's a volunteer EMT, still is today. She was the second person in the high school weight room that morning when that page came through. Fortunately, chief of police met her at the door so she could at least prepare herself for uh, the situation and the condition my dad was in. I get that call, nothing really sank in. I get a hold of my brother Todd. And Todd at this time was actually in Jamaica at a college roommate's wedding. Able to get a hold of him five minutes before he saw and seen and what had happened. Called my uncle Greg, who's the athletic director and head football coach at Humboldt. He said he'd take care of getting hold of the rest of his family. Get off that, I get another phone call telling me just to go to Covenant Medical Center in Waterloo. The hope was to airlift my dad to Iowa City. When I got that call, I knew that meant my father had passed away. And so my mom explains, if I want, I can come to the hospital to have a moment with my dad. For me, I needed that. So I get to go to the hospital, talk to my brother six months later. He said, Aaron, I needed to be in Jamaica. I couldn't have dealt with the things that you had to deal with that day with the media, with being right there. I needed time to progress. And my biggest takeaway from losing my father is this. Each and every person deals with things differently. Each and every person needs, to, they go through different stages. Yes, we have all our stages of grief, but they don't come at the same time. And what that looks like isn't going to look the same for you as it might for your spouse, as it might for a sibling, as it might for your children. And that's okay. As long as we understand, we do need to deal with things. But in going through, you know, I go, I, I get a moment with my dad, which I need. And as we're leaving the hospital, the Department of Criminal Investigation uh, tells my mother and I, hey, we need a press release. School shootings are national stories. Unfortunately, they're becoming more and more common. So it's not as aha moment. And, but, but it's still one day, all the cameras, everybody's there. And so the DCI, they assign us this gal. So we go back to my parents' house, and his friends and family are starting to gather. This lady starts telling us everything we should say in our press release. And tell me how, you know, if you want, I'll just give you a press release. Well, back to third grade, when I wanted to be just like my dad. I told my mom, Mom, I'll go do our press release. So my platform, my opportunity, came at 3 o'clock that afternoon. I was in our elementary gymnasium with about 100 media people there. And so as they're there, I get up to speak, and what I can tell you is this. Nothing had sank in what had happened. We hadn't had a murder in Parkersburg since 1923. So never in my wildest imagination, I think I'd go through something like that. But the second thing, when I spoke, I was, trying to exactly say, or I was trying to say exactly what my father would have said had he been able to be there to speak for himself. I asked for prayers for Dave and Joan Becker, the parents of Mark Becker. I can say with 100% confidence the last thing that his parents wanted that day was for him to go in our weight room and shoot my dad. I have zero question about that. No question. The other thing I remembered was this. My dad telling me anybody can lead when things are going well. True leadership gets revealed when we're faced with adversity. I knew if Ed Thomas was going to have any kind of legacy, 
If my dad was going to be remembered for the great things he did, it would be how his family responded in those moments and those situations. And I'll tell you, I was in shock. Nothing had sank in on that day for my platform. I couldn't imagine June 24, 2009. But I'll tell you, I was prepared for it. And the way I was prepared for it, I had two great parents who loved me, who supported me, who showed me how to deal with adversity. I had great teachers in a community around me where I came from somewhere special and I knew I could get through tough situations. So I couldn't dream it up. I was prepared for it and decided to make the most of it. And, you know, in going through tough things and tough parts of our lives, what became very clear to me is this. I promise every person in this auditorium, every one of you, you will all lose loved ones. I promise. And you don't always get to pick when or why or how nor may you get the goodbye you think you deserve or you wish you got to have. But it's going to happen. And you still have the opportunity to choose how are those people going to be remembered? How are they going to live through me? How did they inspire me? What can I do to keep them with me? You know, the other thing that when we go through tough things in our life that I'm going to tell you is sometimes things happen to us that we do not ask for and we do not deserve. But unfortunately, you're the only person who gets to decide, what do you do with it? You know, losing my dad, I had to make a decision. I could feel sorry for myself. I could be bitter. I could be angry. I could be all those things, but nothing's going to change. I had to make a choice. Was I going to dust myself off, get myself up, and move forward? Or was I going to live in June 24, 2009, the rest of my life? It's a choice that nobody could make but myself. And in going through those tough things, three things helped me get, get through this adversity. Three things my dad said, so I'm going to give them to you today. Hopefully something will stick or resonate or you can relate to. But number one, he'd always say things like, um, when you deal with adversity, or he'd say, life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I choose to respond. See, in losing my dad, I could feel sorry for myself. I could be bitter and I could be angry. And most people today would say, that's okay. He deserves to act that way. Somebody killed his dad. But the bottom line, I can be as mad as I want to be, and my dad's still going to be gone. It's not going to change. The only difference, my three boys, I'd be cheating them out of the dad they deserve. My wife would not have the husband she deserves. And those young people I get to lead now as the principal at Applington Parkersburg High School would be cheated the leader all for something I cannot change. It's about our attitude. I was the only person who got to decide how I responded to that situation. Nobody else. You know, Mark Becker took my dad. Was I going to let him determine who I was going to become by an action he committed? I had to make that choice. But when we look at, when we go through those tough things, you know, by choosing the route we did, I've been blessed with unbelievable experiences. Like I said, had the opportunity to go to the ESPY Awards, right? The year after my father was killed, my dad was the, uh, on the, he was the first high school football coach ever on the cover of Sports Illustrated. So there's a Sports Illustrated article, and it just talks about my dad, not as a football coach, but as a man, as what he stood for, about our community. Then the ESPY Award, so 22 of our family members, closest friends flown out to L.A., nicest hotels, nicest restaurants. You know, I don't know how many of you watch reruns of the Beverly Hillbillies, but I know that's what we look like. Um, <laughs> two of my aunts had never flown before. You know, they're on a plane, and, and so we get off the airport, and first thing we do, we go to a Cubs-Dodgers games. And my kids sit in the front row of a Cubs-Dodgers game. It's Pat Sajak literally two seats down from where my kids are sitting. My kids, they get that same trip, they get to go to Disneyland. They get to go swim in the ocean. For me, I get to go to the ESPYs. Love sports. Every sports star you could ever imagine sitting in a room from me to you, no different than that. That video clip we watched about my father, that was shown live on ESPN about my dad. I have Brett Favre, he hands me my ESPYs. I get to speak and talk about my dad live on a national television. That was my first true speaking, a little nerve-wracking. Live television with LeBron James and, and all these sports stars sitting right out in the audience. But it was an opportunity because of how we responded, not after, but in the heat of the moment, in that tough time. If I decide to be bitter and angry and I start blaming everybody else and point fingers, I promise you there's no ESPY. There's no book written about my dad. I'm not here speaking to you today to tell you how to be bitter and angry because that's, there's nothing good about it. It's our choice. 10% what happens, 90% how you choose to respond. The second thing when we go through adversity that I heard often growing up is that somebody out there always has it worse than you do, and that 100% includes me. I had a great dad for 30 years. 
Am I going to complain because I only had 30 years of a great father? When there's people who have no relationships with their dad, people who lose their dads at a young age. My father grew up the son of an alcoholic. First 18 years of my dad's life was absolutely nothing like mine. Nothing like mine. My dad died at 58 and didn't have one drop of alcohol his entire life. Did it change his childhood? Absolutely not. Did it change mine? For sure. So I'm going to complain because there's only 30 years of a great dad? Yes, I wish there was more time. But I've got to make a choice. I'm going to be grateful for the 30 years I had, for the, for the dad I had who loved me, who gave me an example of what it looks like to lead a family, what it looks like to care for your children, what it looks like to set an example. I had a teammate when I played basketball, Drake. Dante Harris from Seattle, Washington. Dante grew up in foster care his entire life, not with a foster family in a foster facility. By the time he came to Drake, he was the father of two kids already. He and his girlfriend move out here. He went to junior college. He was the third highest ranked gang member in Seattle when he decided he had to do something different in his life. Went to San Francisco Junior College and came here. One road trip, he and I roomed together. I said, Dante, why'd you come to Iowa? Why'd you, how'd you end up here? I'll never forget, he said, Aaron, I thought all you people and Iowa had was corn, and that my family would be safe, so I came here. Every Drake basketball game at the Knapp Center, I have two parents sitting up in the stands cheering me on, taking me out to eat after, Mom, bringing me cookies, all those things. Never once did Dante Harris experience that. So at 30 years old, am I going to call Dante Harris, a guy who never had a father, and say, hey, can you believe somebody killed my dad, when here's a guy who never experienced that? It's about our perception. And it's not just major loss. How many of us each and every day we get up and we can get in that old poor me moment? Oh, I got to go to work and my boss expects me to get all this work done. Or we got all these new regulations. And, and I got to get my kids to the 19 activities I signed them up for. And oh, nobody else could be, goes through what I go through. I challenge you on those days, take a step back and look at how truly grateful and how much you've been blessed. Because I guarantee you, somebody out there would love to trade places with you. They wish they had your life, your family, your career, your church family, your sense of community, whatever it is. It's about perspective. But somebody out there would love to trade places with you, and they have it much worse than you do. The third and final thing that kind of helped me get through um, losing my dad that I've used often, and what he'd say is the greatest gift God's given any of us is the power to choose. And each and every day we have to make choices. Four decisions, in my opinion, you make each and every day. Number one choice, what is my attitude for this day? Attitude is a beautiful thing. You're the only person who gets to control it. It doesn't come when I turn 16 or if I turn 35. It doesn't matter what my title is. If I'm a CEO, if I'm a secretary, if I'm a custodian, if I'm unemployed, it doesn't matter. You control your attitude. And with the beauty of attitude is this. Your attitude impacts every single person you come in contact with every single day. Your attitude will make somebody have a little bit better day or a little bit worse day, all in your interaction. One of the most powerful things we possess is the opportunity to impact others with our attitude. What I tell our high school teachers our first day of in-service every single year, well, every single year, I've been a principal two years, so two years. <laughs> what I tell my teachers is this. If you're in your classroom and you don't want to be there, I will promise you 23 other people will not want to be in there with you either. Attitude. You know, after my father was killed two days later, I was asked if I'd come back to Applington Parkersburg and take my dad's job, if I'd be the next athletic director. And I'll tell you first, I wanted no part of that. I didn't want to go back there. I didn't want to see the bus barn where my father was murdered every day. You know, my dad loved his football field. Put way too much water, way too much fertilizer, mowed it three times a week. Loved it. I didn't want to hear from all his buddies, you know the field's getting a little brown. You know your dad would have done this. You know, your dad did it like that. My dad still used a typewriter. I wasn't going to do that. Don't do that. But I didn't want those things. Didn't want those comparisons. I was at Union. It was a bigger school. I was making more money. I was becoming my own Coach Thomas. There's only going to be one Coach Thomas ever in Parkersburg. And that's never going to be me. And I'm good with that now. But I didn't want that. Talk to my wife, who's much smarter than I am. She said, Aaron, what about your mom and how much she enjoys having the grandkids around. Someday she might need us to help move snow and mow her and keep her company and just do all those things. I said, how about the 22 young kids who were in that weight room and experienced your dad being murdered? Maybe we can help them somehow. And then I heard my dad's voice saying, never forget where you came from. 
Was I not going to go back to Parkersburg when Parkersburg needed me the most? Because it might be a little bit tough for me. So I ended up going home, taking the job. Union was kind enough to let me out of my contract. It was the best thing I ever did, moving back home. But my first task, however, was to go to our temporary high school in Appleton. Because again, our high school just got rebuilt. My dad didn't have anything moved in there yet. So I go get all my dad's belongings, all the AD files, and I move it to our brand new building that he was so excited to be in. And that day, I go into his office in Appleton. I find this hanging up on his wall. And it says attitude. So I grab it, and I put it in a folder to take with me. But then I start reading it once. And it says attitude. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstance, than failure, than success, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, giftness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in certain ways. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play in the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me, 90% how I react to it, and so it is with you. We are all in charge of our attitudes. And that's written by Charles Swindoll. Attitude. Most powerful thing we possess each and every day. Is your attitude going to make people better, or is it going to make people worse? You're the only ones who get to decide it each and every day. The second, third thing we decide each and every day, in my opinion, go hand in hand. How you spend your time and how you spend your resources. You see, verbally with words, I can stand up here all day and tell you what matters most to me. Tell you about my family, my school, my community, my church, whatever. The things that I think matter. But those are just words. Words take nothing to say. They're endless. They go on and on and on. There's no proof of it. If I want to prove to you what matters, I, want, I need to prove that with my time. We get 24 hours a day. What do we do with it? You know, when I speak and I get the opportunity to travel and as, as a basketball coach, I'm not always home. So for my kids, if I just call them when I'm done speaking and say, hey, I love you, you know, a lot of nights I don't get to put them to bed, that's just words. You know, I'll never forget this summer. I was gone for, for six days, went to three different states. And I talked to my kids on the phone, obviously, every day, tell them how excited I was to see them. Get home on Sunday, and I was tired. I was ready to just kind of relax. So we go to church come home. It was also the U.S. Open Sunday. I like golf. I'm bad at it, but I like it. All I want to do is sit on the couch and relax. Got three boys. Dad, can we go golfing? I don't know if you've ever been golfing with a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old. There's nothing relaxing about it. So I have to make a choice. Here I've been telling my kids on the phone all week how I couldn't wait to be back with them, couldn't wait to hang out with them. And I got to make a choice. Go golf with them, sit on the couch, watch TV, relax, catch up. Was it going to be my words? Or was it going to be my actions? Good thing there's DVR. We went out, we golfed, came home, watched the rest of the golf tournament. <laughs> With my wife, I could clean our house spotless. That doesn't mean near to her what it means if just she and I will go out for a date, go out to eat. If I'll sit there and watch one of those HGTV shows or a Hallmark movie maybe, something like that, she wants my time. Things that matter to me, i got to invest my time in it. It can't just be my words. Same thing with our money, our resources. I don't know anybody who gives money to things they don't truly believe in. We work too hard for it. We're not just going to throw it away. If we are willing to put our dollars, our hard work money, into something, we must believe in it. So I challenge you to look at what do you say matters most. Does that match up with your time? Does it match up with um, your resources? Because you've got to make those choices every day. Make sure it's not just words. I'm not perfect at it, but I'm getting better because I'm aware. The fourth and final thing we decide each and every day is our relationships. Do we care about other people? Or are we just in this thing for ourselves? How much can I get? How much can I accumulate? What about me? I learned so much about relationships after my father passed away. My dad's visitation, we saw people from 1.30 that afternoon to 11.30 that night. 4,500 people came through the visitation, not because he's a good football coach. There's all kinds of good football coaches because he cared about people. And I heard story after story of things my dad did for others I had no clue of growing up. Former players coming through tell me, hey, do you know your dad bought my cleats for me every single year because we couldn't afford them? Guys coming through, your dad actually came to my house, sat in my living room and told my parents he wanted me a part of his football team because he saw something special in me. Nobody had ever said anything positive about me to my parents before, ever. 
had another guy come through. The only reason I went to college is your dad said he knew I could do it, and if your dad believed in me, I believed in myself. It was that powerful. And the final one really got to me. You know, th this guy was about 10 years older than me. His mom actually babysat me growing up. Came through, he said, Aaron, I've never told you this. He said, the day my father committed suicide, your dad was the first person in my house that morning. I heard him talk to my mom. I heard him walk up the steps, and he just came to my bed. He put his arm around me. He said, none of this was my fault, and he sat there and cried with me. I didn't know any of those things. My dad didn't do it so everybody would say, oh, Ed Thomas, he's a great guy. He did it because he cared about people. And it's about relationships. It's not what we can get from other people. It's what can we give. My dad was huge on this thing called servant leadership. Servant leadership. My dad didn't look for people where he could push himself to get higher. What he looked to do is reach down and pull them with him. To dust them off. Pick them up and move forward. What's our impact going to be? You know, my dad didn't leave some legacy of a lot of money. I told you he was a teacher. I don't have money but he left relationships. He made a difference. He invested in other people. You know, one thing I kind of steal from my associate pastor that, that he told, talked about one time, you know, in our world, we get so wrapped up. When we're born, we're at the hospital, and our parents, when they bring us home, they bring us to our room. And usually in that room, we'd have a bed, our crib, and we'd have a dresser. And then we become successful when we get older and we start accumulating things. And then we become successful when we get in our 30s and our 40s and we get our vacation home. We get our second or third car. We get a little bit bigger house. Then if we're fortunate enough to live a long time, then we got to downsize. So we sell some of our stuff. Then we move in to a condo or somewhere where we don't have to mow or do all those things. And if we're fortunate enough and we live a real long life, all of a sudden maybe we end up in a nursing home. And at our nursing home, what do we have left with us? We have our bed and we have our dresser. Stuff doesn't matter. Relationships, however, never go away. The question is, how do you make other people feel? Do you bring out the absolute best in them? You make that choice. What are our relationships? I'm going to close today. i got one video. In this video, it's short. This is my dad speaking about five months before he was killed. After the tornado, he went around and did some speaking, basically as a thank you to all the people who came to Parkersburg. He had a platform. He had an opportunity. So we're going to watch this. I'm going to give you four things, and then I'm going to make sure I finish right on time. So if we can start that video. There are a lot of you young people in here tonight, and I want to share one thing with you. I'm doing what I'm doing today and tonight because of an impact of, of my high school football coach, Jerry Dolly. And I carried him to his grave. But I don't know if I ever took the time to tell him what he meant in my life. You young people, take time. Think about who, who's helped you become who you are today. Take time to give them a call. If it be mom, if it be dad, if it be your high school coach, a grandparent, or send them a letter, tell them thanks for what you've done for me. You know, as a coach and as a teacher with you young people, we're not trying to just how to teach you science and math and history and how to play the game of football. They're trying to in some way make a difference in your life. That's why I do what I do today. I've looked at what I do as my mission field in life. God put me in Parkersburg, Iowa for a reason. Maybe this past year was a reason, I'm not sure. But I do know this, I'm in the greatest profession there is in this world, I think, because I get to work with young people like you every day of my life. And God willing, I'm gonna be able to do that for a few more years, I hope. But I have a greater passion for what I do now because I realize my time is getting less. Young people have a passion for whatever you do in life. Have a passion for what you do. And impact other people. I heard Lou Holtz talk out at Notre Dame. And 
He closed that day with three questions. And I'm going to close with those same three questions tonight. He said three questions to ask of yourself. Number one, do you care about other people? Number two, can people trust you? And number three, are you committed to excellence in every phase of your life? From your relationship to God to what you're going to do as a profession. And you think about those three questions. That says a lot about the type of person you are. So as I wrap up today, you know, if you want to rewatch those videos or share those with anything, if you go to Ed Thomas Family Foundation, we have a website. Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter, all those different things as well. I encourage you to check those things out. But, you know, my dad was big on four quarters, so four things um, hopefully you took from me today. Number one, I truly hope you're prepared for your platforms and your opportunities and you decide to make the most of those moments. You don't always get to pick what they're going to be, but you do have the choice of what are you going to do with it. The second thing, I truly hope that you're people of passion. I hope you don't have jobs or careers, but you're passionate about what you get to do each and every day. Number three, I hope you never forget where you came from. And those people have impacted and shaped you to become the successful people you are today. I also hope you're willing to create that special place for the next generation. That place where they feel empowered and that they can do whatever it is they want to accomplish. Fourthly and finally, I hope you're willing to invest in other people. I hope you do that with your attitude, with your time, with your money, and with your relationships. It's truly been an honor and a privilege. Hopefully I'll have the opportunity to visit with some of you uh, later on when I'm at the booth in, in the gym there. But God bless and thank you for the opportunity.